Hey everyone, Ronan here, and welcome back to the channel. This one was a bit of a doozy to make, as you can consider this to be the mid-season finale for What If Ash Won the Hoenn League, if you will. But before we get into today's episode, we've got a couple of things we got to do. First things first, we got to shout out the patron. So, my partner in crime, my YouTube buddy, Plus Ultraman, thank you very much for the support. And also, everyone, analytics are very important. So please, make sure to drop a like and a comment to help fuel the algorithm. Them. Watch all the way to the end so that way we can get the watch time. And if you're new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so that way you'll never miss another upload. But with all that being said, let's get into what if Ash won the Hoenn League? Part 9. I hope you enjoy. We begin today's episode with Ash and Pikachu as they are outside Fortree City. However, it's only our hero and his six Pokemon. It has been a week since his loss to Winona and Ash has been on an intense training regimen. The words of Drew and May keep replaying in his mind. He doesn't understand his Pokemon. He keeps fighting against their natural ways of doing things. However, our hero is having trouble seeing the path to this. His way of battling and the natural abilities clash in a way that he has never experienced before. While his past teams have all had their own personalities, the one thing that had been consistent is them doing things the way Ash felt was right. But now it seems as if it's not only his Pokemon that will have to evolve to get stronger, but him as well. However, the boy is starting to feel like he may eventually find this right path, though the destination is still unclear. Ash knows that he and his Pokemon will walk it together and achieve their ultimate goal. This leads us into the training that Ash has been currently undertaking with the Pokemon he wants to use in the rematch with Winona. Pikachu, Mawile, and Vibrava all have been the focus of Ash for the last week, while Feebas and Slackoth have been providing their support in developing new combo techniques that Ash has thought of after all the time he spent watching them. For Pikachu, it's working on a move that combines its Iron Tail with Thunderbolt. Using the Steel Charge, it draws in the electricity, creating an arching ball of energy that Pikachu can use in different ways. But the flow of power between the two is something that the mouse is yet to master. Ash has come to call this Electro Volley, as it can produce multiple balls of energy for defense or offense. Then there is Mawile. Its tendencies for showmanship and dancing matches well with its sandstorm. The steel type has an uncanny ability to match the flow of the sand it produces to its dancing patterns. Because Mawile has been working on this since the first time it was exposed to a contest, it is farther along in its training than the others. As such, it masterfully demonstrates the control of the sandstorm, extending the attack from its limbs as it gracefully dances and spins as if they were extensions of its natural movement. Ash has come to call this attack sand whip. They have proven to be very resilient in defending from attacks while attacking at the same time, as demonstrated by the way it interacts with the training from the others. This brings us to Vibrava. The dragon, having a mischievous nature, was the hard one to pin down, but Ash was able to identify a strange interaction its dragon's breath had with the vibration of its wings. By surrounding itself in the dragon's breath and using its wings, Vibravo can create sonic vibrations that create a backlash that spreads out over a wide area. This can be sent as far as needed, but the further it sends, the weaker the attack becomes. The problem Ash has found is the power output from the wings that Vibrava puts in. The dragon has trouble controlling the flow of vibrations, so that is what the dragon has been working on. Ash has come to call this Dragon Burst. However, we are forgetting about one of Ash's team members, the one that is thought to be the strongest of them all, Grovile. Its situation is a bit different. The starter is training on its own, as it usually does, but things seem to be different than in the past. The gecko is having trouble focusing on its training due to one key reason, the loss it had in the gym battle to Altaria. Ash was down, his back to the wall, with Vibrava having been taken out and Pikachu unable to make any real progress against it. So Ash, knowing it was a risk, decided to send in Grovile as his last choice. The Gecko was confident in its abilities to get the job done, as it had so many times before. However, this was quickly proven to be a false sense of confidence, when Altaria proved just how outclassed Grovile was. Unable to keep up with the flying type, Grovile made a decision mid-battle out of frustration to completely ignore the orders of Ash, engaging at its own accord. This caused Grovile to be taken down even quicker, as it couldn't land a single blow. The last thing the starter saw was Altaria hitting it with an ice beam that one-shotted it into oblivion. Now the grass type finds 
finds itself with a shattered pride as it tries to train, but its focus is clouded, causing its attack to lose strength and precision. This causes the frustration to build as the new power that it was feeling is slowly slipping away with each attack. Grovile is beginning to spiral into a well of self-doubt as visions of its past failures replay in its head. Then, to add insult to injury, the grass starter is forced to watch as the other's Pokemon continue to grow as they master these new techniques. It doesn't know it yet, but if Grovile is unwilling to change, then it will be the one that is left behind. While Ash and his Pokemon continue down their unknown path, we move over to Mei. You see, Ash isn't the only one that has been in intense training. She has been hard at work as her next contest is coming up soon. The Lily Cove contest is a super contest over the course of two days with multiple different contest classes. Mei aims to gather at least one ribbon over the course of the event, but more importantly, she wants to battle as many coordinators as possible so that way she can refine her battle abilities. She needs as much experience as possible and exposure to other quality trainers and Pokemon is the only way to ensure that happens. What we see is Mei polishing off any strategies that she has come up with over the last few months with all of the new abilities and evolutions her Pokemon have gained. She is confident that victory is within her direct path. This leaves us with Brock and Max. They have been at the Pokemon Center the entire time following up with the effects of the Super Block. Torkoal is the primary focus as it was the only one to ingest one of the perfect samples. The results that Brock and Max have observed are astonishing. The fire type has been burning coal at a clean rate. Its attacks have been more powerful with intensity in its flamethrower and overheat being demonstrated. However, there is a drawback. While the attacks are more intense, they drain more energy. This causes the turtle to be unable to use its attacks as frequently as it normally would. Max comments on this asking if there is any danger. Brock says he doesn't think so as Torkoal just tires out quicker. After some rest, it's back to normal. Brock thinks that the key to this new power for Torkoal is for it to train. Getting used to the power is something that the turtle will have to do. So, they will have to monitor Torkoal and Brock's other Pokemon as they have used all the different levels of the Pokeblock. This brings us to the night before Ash's rematch. They are all eating, including all of the Pokemon. May questions if Ash has thought about what her and Drew have said to him. Ash nods, telling May that their comments have allowed him to view past the tunnel vision that has been clouding his judgment. Thanks to them, he and his Pokemon have been able to reach a new level of power which they will see in tomorrow's battle. Smiling, May asks if he has given any thought to the Pokemon he will use. Ash comments that aside from one change, the choices will be the same. May tells Ash he seems confident, so she's glad he found what he needed to get back on track. However, Ash's comment may not have affected those that were in the conversation. It did hold some weight on one member of his party, as Grovile's own self-doubt sinks it deeper into its own dark well of thought. The next morning, Ash and the gang are up bright and early. After a meal, our hero finds himself at the gym ready for his rematch. Ash knows this is big. This was the first gym he didn't even stand a chance of beating, so the future of his Hoenn League challenge is on the line here. This feeling is reaffirmed when Ash locks eyes with Winona as she is just opening the gym. So, you're back, the leader says. Have you found the winds of change that were needed? Smiling, Ash tells Winona the only way to find out is for them to have their battle. Smiling back, Winona finds comfort in this answer, so she tells Ash to follow her. As the two take their positions, May asks Brock if he thinks that Ash has found himself. The former gym leader tells May that the one thing Ash has always done is what's best for his Pokemon. So, if he was the one that needed to grow for them to be better, then he's confident that Ash will rise to the occasion, even if it may take longer than a week. Well, hopefully it's enough, May says, as we change focus to the battle. Both Ash and Winona are staring each other down. He knows the Altaria is going to be the challenge, but there is one thing Thing that he has to keep in mind. He hasn't battled any of the other Pokemon, so he needs to be ready for anything as this battle will be the same as the last one, a three on three with no substitutions on Winona's part. The battle will be over when one side is out of Pokemon, so in order to give himself the best chance possible, Ash decides to lead with Pikachu. As the electric mouse takes to the field, Winona considers her options. The leader is no fool, knowing that Ash probably tailored his strategy to take out Altaria. With a smile on her face, the leader readies a Pokeball, declaring, Swellow, go! The regional flyer takes to the air as the ball pops, demonstrating its mastery of the skies. As the battle begins, both Pokemon waste no time colliding with the quick attack. Both appear to be even, so to turn on the pressure, Winona orders a double team with Ash calling for an Iron Tail. Unfortunately, the bird is able to quickly dodge, leaving the mouse unguarded. Winona takes full advantage of this opening as her bird is able to connect with the devastating aerial ace. Even with Pikachu's speed, it's unable to avoid the move as it is carried into the sky with the powerful charge. Ash knows that the
they have to do something, and this is the perfect time for Pikachu's new move. Now, use Electro Volley, Ashiels. The mouse is carried higher and higher as it charges its tail with the metal energy of Iron Tail. Then, sparks erupts from the red sacks on its cheeks. Realizing they may be in trouble, Winona orders Swellow to break contact and put distance between the two. However, this is going to be a little too late as Pikachu completes its move, creating a ball of energy around the two. This is the more defensive way to use the combo attack meant to prevent damage from Pikachu, but Ash in his on-the-fly battle style has found a third use for it, creating a cage to trap Swellow. This has two effects. One, Swellow is drawn in close to Pikachu as the attack traps the two together in a sphere of energy. The second thing is, the two begin to rapidly fall towards the ground. Ash tells Pikachu to make sure Swellow is on the receiving end of the fall, maximizing the damage to the bird. Winona is forced to think quick and throws safety to the wind, ordering her bird to fire a hyper beam as the two fall to the ground. The last thing both trainers see is an explosion as the two are consumed while hitting the ground. A cloud of dust is thrown up from the impact as both trainers cover their eyes from the light that blinds them. As the light and dust fades, Pikachu and Swellow both stand facing each other having taken the brunt of the two attacks. Pikachu begins to wobble as Swellow begins to flap its wings, taking back to the air. Realizing this is their chance to finish this, Winona calls for a quick attack. Swellow dives trying to gain speed, however, just as it sets to increase its pace, the bird's vision blurs as it crashes into the battlefield, revealing spirals in its eyes. The first battle is called with Pikachu as the winner, but Ash knows that wasn't a real victory. Pikachu took way more damage there than he had intended, and now the mouse may be unable to go any further. Ash tells the mouse to come back as Winona recalls her bird. That move that Ash used was a combination move. That type of thing is common in contests, which she wouldn't be surprised about as he was in the Feather Carnival. Winona will have to be careful as if this is what his training was about then this battle will be far tougher than last time. Ash takes Pikachu over to the stands and asks his friends to look after it. The mouse is quick to protest this but Ash tells it to stay. The damage it took was bad. A hyper beam at point blank isn't something that most can walk away from so it needs to put its trust in the rest of their team as Ash has done. The mouse relents as Ash walks away. Now back to the battlefield Winona tells Ash that she didn't think that she would have lost that last one but not to think that he's won the battle as she will not be beaten so easily. However, Ash doesn't have the same cocky outlook that he had the last time they had battled. He is calm and focused, telling Winona that he has been riding the highs of each victory until this point, but that's not something that he will be doing anymore. He heard what everyone was telling him, and listens to his Pokemon. He knows that they are not the only ones that will need to evolve if they hope to win the Hoenn League, so he will too, as he pulls out his next choice. Winona readies her next choice as both her and Ash send them in simultaneously. Skarmory, go! Mawile! I choose you. The duo of steel types emerge from their balls with Mawile gracefully bowing to greet both Winona and its opponent. This kind of etiquette is something that the leader hasn't seen from a Pokemon before, causing her to compliment Ash and Mawile on it. Smiling, Ash tells Mawile they managed to win their first battle, so he's counting on her to continue the trend. With a confident smile, Mawile feels that it's finally going to get the chance it needs to shine on a wide stage. With the ref calling for the second battle to start, Winona wastes no time calling for a Leer to bring down the natural defense of the Steel type, but Ash isn't going to let this detour them, calling for a Sandstorm to hide his Mon. While this won't hurt Skarmory as it shares the steel typing with Mawile, it will hide her from the sight, making it harder to hit. This is proven to be successful when a drill peck fails to connect while presenting an opening that allows Mawile to grab the armor clad bird in its massive jaws with a bite attack. This isn't going to cause a massive amount of damage, but it is going to ground Skarmory, forcing Winona and Ash into an awkward position. Neither one of their Pokemon can complete an attack, or at least that's what Ash thinks, until Skarmory lets out a swift attack that pelts Mawile in the face, forcing it to relinquish its grip to prevent any further damage. Now that the bird is free, it is able to hit for a good amount of damage when Winona calls for a steel wing that is able to connect with the ping from within the sandstorm. Realizing that his mon needs to put distance between the two, Ash calls for Mawile to use Sand Whip. Slowly, the power of the sand is pulled close to the steel type as it slowly circles, creating a barrier of some sort that is quickly put to the test by Winona as a drill peck is unable to penetrate it. However, this isn't what is important 
as what follows is a demonstration of just how well Mawile has been able to master this technique. This is where Ash unveils his next new trick as he tells Mawile to go on the assault. The steel type is able to use the sand as an extension that forces Skarmory to fly at the will of its opponent. While the sand doesn't hurt the bird, it does block its ability to get a full view of the battlefield, but Mawile is smart as Ash commands it to hide behind the pillars that it creates, allowing it to move freely across the battlefield, even when Nona is unable to fully see what is going on from her skybox. This forces Skarmory low in an attempt to connect with the steel wing, but again, it finds itself in the clutches of Mawile's second mouth with a bite. Ash orders Mawile to then use the move that it's been holding back, as it throws Skarmory into the air and then pelts it with an ancient power. Unfortunately, this isn't enough to end the bird, as it was able to shake off the damage it took to regain some air. While Ash is feeling confident, there is one truth that he has come to acknowledge. Mawile just doesn't have the ability to cause damage on a high scale here. So even though he is in control, he makes the conscious decision to recall the steel type. Wait, why would he do that, may ask? He was in control. While this is true, those moves that Ash was using weren't really causing any damage to Skarmory. Ash realized that Mawile was in control, but the endurance factor between the two is miles apart, as Skarmory just has to wait for Mawile to tire out. Ash saw this is what Winona was trying to do, so he knew he had to make a change or be in a worse position when facing Altaria if he is able to get that far. May hopes Brock is right as we fade to Ash holding his final Pokeball in his hand. He knows that his choice will be a battle defining one, but he has no other options as if he hopes to beat Winona, then he will have to be in her element. As he declares, Vibrava, I choose you! Emerging from its ball, the dragon takes to the sky as it demonstrates a speed that is far superior than Skarmory's. So, Ash, you want to take this to the sky, do you? Fine, Skarmory, use Drill Pick. Knowing they need to use this to their advantage, Ash orders his dragon to dive. Vibrava takes off in the direction of the ground, but this is where Skarmory reveals that it has a brief advantage when it is in a dive. Its weight works to this advantage, forcing it to fall faster, quickly closing the gap between the two, allowing it to land a Drill Pick. However, Vibrava continues to fall with Skarmory, much to the surprise of Winona as Ash calls for it to use a dig. The half ground type is able to tunnel beneath the battlefield at a high rate of speed, preventing any damage on its part as Skarmory crashes into the battlefield. But this isn't enough to bring down the steel type. That is, until Vibrava surfaces, connecting with the dragon's breath, finally bringing this battle to an end. Winona recalls the flyer, impressed that Ash used both land and sky to bring her Skarmory down. But all of this has been a formality, as the real threat has always been her final Pokemon, with Winona sending in the one Pokemon that Ash has feared since this battle began, Altaria. As the Cotton Dragon emerges, a gust of wind follows through the gym. You feel that, Ash? Those are the winds of change. I hope you are ready, as Altaria is my oldest Pokemon and won't be taken down as easily as the last two. Ash thinks that Winona is crazy if she thinks using three of his Pokemon to take out two of hers was easy, but this is what he knew was coming and he intends to go the distance, choosing to leave in Vibrava for the time being. With the start of this battle, Ash goes on the attack, calling for a Dragon's Breath. This is a move that could cause great damage if it connects. This was a smart choice on Ash's part, as he figured Winona would start this battle the same way she did before with Dragon Dance. While the damage it takes is super effective, the gain it received from the dance puts it in a whole nother place of confidence from the point of view of Winona, as when Ash tries for a second Dragon's Breath, the move is torn through with an Ice Beam that strikes Vibrava and sends it into the battlefield below. This is a scary moment for Ash, as it could end his dragon. However, with a little luck, it was barely able to survive, showing that it's still functioning by vibrating its wings. However, Ash realizes he needs to change it up again, recalling Vibrava so that way he can send back in Mawile. This could make things a little complicated as Steel isn't something Winona may be able to best as Ash begins with a double team. Realizing she's gonna have to battle close, Winona orders Altaria to dive and attack with a Dragon's Breath of its own. The Dragonic attack swirls around Mawile as Ash calls for a Sandstorm to be used as a shield to block any damage, but this is what Winona was waiting for as she reveals her way of dealing with Mawile. Altaria slams itself into the battlefield as the command of an earthquake is given. As the shockwaves come, Ash calls for one final ancient power that is able to connect with Altaria as the steel type falls to the ground type attack, bringing this battle to a close. Ash recalls it, thanking Mawile for the effort that it put in. He truly feels like he is beginning to understand it. Now Ash has a choice, but to him, there is only one as Pikachu watches from Brock's arms. Vibrava, I choose you! Still feeling the effects of the ice beam, Vibrava is a little slower than normal as it pops from the 
ball. But Ash and it both know that there is a battle to be won, as the boy, for the first time since they begin, is beginning to see a plan of attack. Winona wastes no time in going on the attack for herself, calling for another ice beam. But Ash is quick to counter, ordering a dig. This prevents any damage from the attack. But now the problem that Ash has to face is when it surfaces. Altaria will be there to attack it. But Ash thinks that he may have a plan for this, ordering their new combo move. While under the battlefield, Vibrava begins the process of its move as Ash calls for a dragon burst. Winona is unsure of what's going to happen, telling Altaria to be ready. But they won't have to wait as the results of this attack are quickly revealed when a burst of rocks and dragonic energy erupt from the ground, shooting into the air that strikes Altaria. This is a double-edged sword, as it is hit with two different types of attacks that it is weak to. Winona's ace drops to the ground, unable to maintain its flight. The leader then calls to it in an attempt to recover some altitude, but it's no use as Altaria crashes, Vibrava surfaces using a sand tomb at the command of its trainer. While this doesn't hurt the flying type, it binds it so that its speed is no longer a factor. This allows a free shot to end the battle by calling for another dragon's breath. However, Winona isn't out yet as Altaria still has an ice beam that it fires. Both Pokemon are hit with these battle ending attacks that knock them out. This brings the whole thing to a close as Ash is being declared the winner, with Pikachu still technically able to battle. And for what seems like an eternity, Ash is finally able to breathe a sigh of relief. It seems his new approach to his Pokemon is exactly what was needed to change things up. This is proven when Winona presents Ash with the Feather Badge. She tells Ash that it looks like he found his Winds of Change. Don't lose that feeling, she says, as it will carry him and his Pokemon to new heights. Ash celebrates with his Pokemon and their victory. This is something that Ash didn't know he needed as he thanks Winona for giving him the chance to grow. While this is happening, May and the others are all thinking about what Ash had demonstrated here with his new combo moves. It is in this moment that May realizes that she needs to step it up. Ash is serious about his growth, and she may have been holding back. If she can create something akin to what Ash did, then she will surely win the next contest. This leads us to the night of Ash's win at the Fortree Gym. May and Ash are talking about the battle. She is doing everything she can to pick his brain about how he discovered those new moves. Ash just tells her that he watched his Pokemon. He tried to get into their heads and feel what they feel. It allowed them to connect on a level that they had never had before. When that happened, it made him able to see things from their perspective. From there, things just took off with them unlocking each of their moves one by one, though they are far from perfect and will require a lot of practice to get there. May hangs on every word as Max and Brock talk on their own. Brock is urging Max to take the time and talk with May. They haven't spoken a word in almost a month. She's your sister, he says so this can't continue forever. Brock is speaking from experience due to his many siblings back in Pewter City. Max thinks about this as we now have the ability to move on to their next destination, Lilico City. But this is going to take around two weeks as the trek is going to be a long weaving path through the mountainous forest area. So Ash and May waste no time in training every chance they get. In this time, May is able to see what Ash was talking about. Each of her Pokemon is different and when you can truly see that, then the possibilities are limitless. This leads her on a journey of discovery with each of her Pokemon that proves to be fruitful with each day of training. However, on a day when Ash and May are in a practice contest battle using Mawile and Seviper, Mawile's whips strike a target that it wasn't meant for and just so happened to be passing by. This is revealed to be a Pokemon called Spoink, but there is something odd about it. The picture in the Pokedex is different than this one as it does not have the pearl on its head, but as Ash points this out, Spoink begins to panic as it needs the pearl to perform from its psychic abilities. Feeling bad about being the cause of this, Ash tells Spoink that he will help the pig find the pearl. Luckily, it seems to have a link with the pearl as the psychic type bounces off in a direction of a towering mountain in the distance. As Ash takes off, he yells to the others, telling them that he will be back as soon as he finds Spoink's pearl. Pikachu and Mawau give chase, leaving May there to figure out things for herself. Since her attention isn't being occupied by Ash, Max finally opens his mouth, asking her if they can talk. Over with Ash, he is chasing Spoink through the forest. The boy yells for it to slow down, but the bouncing piglet refuses to stop as it can sense its pearl on the move. This is where Ash finds them at a river where Spoink is looking at a towering mountain that sits at the center of it. Spoink begins to cry frantically, signaling that its pearl is on the mountain, but Ash tries to talk some sense into it. There's no way the pearl could have ended up there, but Spoink is adamant. Ash is unsure about what to do here as he has no idea where they should go, but Pikachu and Mawile point something out on the shore of the mountain as it appears
others to be a boat and some people heading up to the top. Ash begins to realize that whoever they are, there is a possibility that they could have picked up the pearl by mistake. So Ash does the only thing he can do, recalling Mawile and sending him Feebas. The fish will take Spoink, Ash, and Pikachu over so they can talk with the people that possibly have the pearl. It takes a few minutes, but they eventually arrive with Ash recalling Feebas, thanking it for its help. With nowhere to go but up, Ash and the other two Pokemon begin to make their ascent. What Ash finds is that this mountain is a graveyard maze. It seems that this place is very old, with some of these tombstones looking hundreds of years old. It's not very well maintained either, he thinks to himself, wondering why there would be any kind of people in a place like this. But like it or not, Spoink is in distress, so they continue to climb as fast as they possibly can. But there is a problem they quickly run into when Ash comes across some people that appear to be up to no good. They look like they may be part of Team Magma, as their outfits are very similar, but blue instead of red. Knowing this could be a problem, Ash tries to sneak past them, but this thought is shattered when Spoink just barrels through, causing it to get caught by the two. Now the pig is beginning to panic, which causes Ash to appear, demanding that Team Magma drop Spoink. They have no right to hurt it. This causes the two to break out in laughter, which confuses Ash. Wow, kid, you think we're part of those incompetent screw-ups? Sorry to disappoint you, but we have nothing to do with those losers. We are part of the illustrious Team Aqua, who aims to save the world from those eco-terrorists Team Magma. So you should just hurry along before you get caught up in something that you may regret. But Ash being Ash refuses to leave. Spoink is here for something and these guys are just up to no good. It's here that an explosion can be heard at the top of the mountain, causing everyone to be on edge. This causes the Aqua Grunts to become suspicious of Ash as they send in their Crawdons to attack the boy. However, they are no match for Pikachu and its Electro Volley as the balls trap the crustaceans, shocking them into a coma. The Grunts realize that this kid isn't somebody they should be trying to battle, so they recall their Pokemon and run for the top, dropping Spoink in the process. Checking on the Mon, Ash sees that it is unhurt, but the pig has a one-track mind as it bolts for the top of the mountain with Ash and Pikachu struggling to keep up. What follows is Ash running into more of the grunts as they continue to climb, forcing him to use Mawile, Vibrava, and Slackoth to battle as they work their way up. But with each battle, Spoink gets a little bit more ahead of Ash, completely losing sight of it eventually. But this is a moot point as Ash has the current situation to deal with. But Pikachu and the rest of his Pokemon are able to best the hordes of grunts that keep coming until Ash is finally able to ascend the full length to the top. However, what he finds is a site of mayhem and carnage with an intense battle between two people that Ash has never seen before. A guy dressed like a pirate and a girl dressed in some sort of summer outfit are at odds with each other. I don't know who you are, but take your men and go! Arr! I don't think we'll be doing that, girly. Those two have something very important that Team Aqua requires, so just tell them to hand it over and there won't be any more pain caused here today. I don't know what you're talking about! My grandparents are just the keepers of the shrine! You are desecrating this holy place and I, Phoebe of the Elite Four, will not stand for this disrespect! Now, leave here or you'll regret it! This causes the pirate, who Ash has learned is called Phantom, to laugh uncontrollably. But that is the least of his worries, as Ash notices that Spoink is being held down by a person that he is very familiar with. That guy that was at the Devon building in Rustboro, the one that stole the shard that they were experimenting on. This is when the true danger of the situation sets in, as an all-out battle between Phoebe and Phantom begins with their Dusclops and Gyarados. The room up here is very limited, and if they are allowed to draw this out, then things could become dire. It's here that Ash decides that he is going to have to get involved. Using Pikachu and Vibrava, Ash comes up with the plan to free Spoink and the grandparents of the Elite Four member. As the battle rages, Vibrava uses its mischievous nature and high frequency pulses of its wings to cause a distraction with the grunts that are searching for something among the ruins that dot the top of the mountain. This draws the attention solely on the dragon, allowing Pikachu to sneak over to the captives. They are unsure if the mouse is there to cause them harm until it uses its iron tail to break their bindings. Pikachu then signals to where Ash is as the boy motions for them to come over, but this is going to be interrupted by the battle that is going on. Gyarados is using a hyper beam to ravage the area as it has been unable to hit Dusclops with any move. This causes the grunt that holds Spoink to drop the psychic type as everyone runs for cover. That's low, Phantom! You can't win, so you'll just attack anyone or anything! Dusclops, use hypnosis! 
The ghost type uses its shadow abilities to get in the face of the serpent as its eyes glow red and they lock on with each other. While this is successful in its command, there is a grave consequence to this action. Gyarados did not subside with the attack, so as it wobbles, the hyperbeam blasts through the area. With the blast of energy now out of control, Ash is forced to step in as he commands Virava and Pikachu to engage with it. Who is this kid? Well, he doesn't appear to be an enemy, so we'll deal with that later. Dusclops, help Pikachu and my brother! The three do their best to control the serpent and where its attacks land. Phantom has been left alone as he notices Phoebe's grandfather trying to reach for something, but this is interrupted by Spoink as it has gotten to the area that the old man is trying to dig up first. The piglet uses its psi wave to lift something out of the buried dirt. Suddenly, a glowing mass is revealed as the pig begins to celebrate, mounting it atop its head. The pig is happy beyond all belief, but this is going to be a short-lived as the last bit of a hyper beam is sent in the direction direction of the old man and Spoink. This forces everyone to act fast as Pikachu, Vibrava, and Dusclops are forced to protect the humans as the Hyper Beam strikes the area. While they are protected, Spoink isn't so lucky as it is blasted off the side of the mountain. Ash jumps in an attempt to save it, but it is just out of reach as the jewel at the top of its head falls and rolls to the feet of Phantom. Smiling, the old sea dog picks it up. Thanks for your help, he says, Phoebe, before he and the Grunts use the confusion of the situation to make their escape. The old man cries, telling Phoebe to stop them. They can't get away with that. But his plea falls on deaf ears as Ash is focused on the only thing that he can do to save Spoink, throwing a Pokeball at it. Luckily, Ash's aim holds true as the ball strikes the psychic type. This action results in its capture as the ball comes back to Ash's hand, with the boy sighing in relief. This forces Ash to make a decision of which Pokemon he needs to send to Professor Oak. Not really having any time to make an important choice like that, the boy selects Mawile for the time being. Now that things have calmed, Ash is able to join the others as they try to make sense of the ramblings of the frantic old man. Grandpa, calm down! We're safe! They're gone! No, we are not. That item they took will bring nothing but chaos and destruction. It can't be that serious, Grandpa. It was just some relic. How would a jewel have that kind of power? Phoebe, those stories I told you as a child were more than just ways to put you to bed at night. Do you remember that story I told you about the prince and the temple? Well, that wasn't just a story. That was something that happened in the past of the Hoenn region. We are descendants of an ancient group of people called the People of the Water. They worship the sea and everything in it. To honor their bonds with the ocean, they built a mighty temple. This temple was said to have no other rival in all of existence. It was so grand that even water Pokemon would grace it with their presence. Even the super ancient Pokemon known as Kyogre. What's Kyogre, Ash asks, to which Phoebe finally realizes that he is still here. Hey, thanks for the help. I'm Phoebe, and these are my grandparents. Ash introduces himself, then restates his previous question. The old man goes on to explain that it is a Pokemon that is said to have made the oceans of the world. To the people of the water, it is their god. They spent centuries honoring it, though it would only awaken every thousand years or so. But when it did, they celebrated the return of the sea beast. That is, until they were caught up in a struggle between it and the one known as Groudon. Wait, I know that one, Ash says. It has the power over land, right? Yes, it is the eternal rival to Kyogre. Usually, the two never cross paths, remaining awake and asleep in different cycles. But for some reason, they had both awoken at the same time. Because of this, the two clashed for dominance of the region of Hoenn. It almost wiped out all life in the entire region, even threatening the world. Well, what stopped it? There was an ancient people that worshipped the sky and its guardian that had stepped in, using its mighty power to stop the duo from causing any more harm. While the region was devastated, the humans knew they had to do something to prevent this from happening again, so they used an ancient source of power that was said to be able to control the two. Our ancestors forged it into a way to do so. By doing this, they were able to move the Pokemon into a place where they could be locked away for all time. While I don't know where Groudon was placed, our ancestors placed Kyogre in their most sacred temple. The sea temple? The one from the stories? Yes, the old man says, but that wasn't the only thing that they did, as the people of the water knew that no one could ever have the key to unsealing Kyogre. So, they used the power of the orbs that controlled Kyogre and Groudon to separate the Sea Temple from the mainland in Hoenn, and set it adrift in the world seas, invisible to anyone that would try to find it. But there is one way to find its true location. The orb is part of a map. You see, the strain of sealing Kyogre and Groudon came at great cost, as the orbs 
just couldn't handle it, so they shattered into several different pieces. In order to protect the future, our ancestors scattered the pieces to the winds of the region. But the Red Orb, the one that controlled Kyogre, didn't break all the way. A large piece survived, so in order to protect it, our family was tasked with hiding it here on Mount Pyre. And so we have lived the last thousand years. Wait, so you're telling me that all the stories you told me were true? Even the part about the prince dying? I'm afraid so, the old man says. But this is where Ash chimes in. Wait, you said they would need two things. Is the orb one of them? And if so, what's the other thing? The old man says it's the prince, but he died a long time ago, and I know of no living descendants. The old man responds, well then, we shouldn't be in any danger. But the old man counters this, saying just because he doesn't know of any descendants doesn't mean there isn't one out there. For all we know, those people could already have the missing piece. And if that's the case, then the region is doomed. Phoebe, promise me you will find the orb before it is too late and bring it back so we can keep it safe. The girl looks her grandparents in the eyes, giving them a nod, now knowing the full gravity of the situation. They then turn to the now unconscious Gyarados that was left behind by Team Aqua. What are we going to do with that, Ash questions? Don't worry, I'll get it down to the water then release it. This Pokemon has been through enough and the least we can do is give it the freedom it deserves. Ash then asks Phoebe if she's really a member of the Elite Four, to which the girl confirms she is. He then informs her of the reason that he is here in Hoenn, and all of the run-ins he's had with the other ones called Team Magma. Now, this Team Aqua makes things that much more dangerous. Not to worry, me and the other Elite Four members are fully aware of their presence. They and the regional champion have been tracking their movements for a while now, so if things go bad, then we'll be there to stop them. But Ash, you seem like a kind and brave trainer, so can I ask you that if you come across these people again, you'll try your best to stop them? Ash nods, saying that he will. The last thing he wants is harm to come to anyone, as we fade back to when our hero catches up with his friends. Ash explains everything that had happened, as they had heard all of the explosions and were beginning to get worried. But Ash tells them he's fine. He even got a new Pokemon, as he releases Spoink from its ball. It's here that Ash poses a question to the piglet, asking it if it would like to join him on his journey. He knows that Spoink is missing its pearl, so if it comes with Ash, then he will help it look for one. The Psychic type thinks about this offer for for a moment, only to find it be a fair one as it bounces up and down accepting the offer that Ash has given it. With a smile, he recalls his newest team member as he and his friends set off for Lily Cove City once more. It has been a few days since the events of Mount Pyre. Ash and his friends find themselves in a place called the Slackoth Gardens. It's said to be the only place that Slackoth can be seen in their natural habitat with no predators in all of Owen. This place has a special meaning to May and Max as their dad used to bring them there as kids. So, they wanted to stop by and see what had changed. Ash and Brock have no problem with this, but Ash thinks it would be good to let his Slackoth join in, so he sends it out. The normal type is excited to see some of its own kind, as it leads the charge to enter the sanctuary. But when our heroes get inside, they find a place of desolation, as there is nothing but barren trees as far as the eye can see. Not one Slackoth can be found. The site is a depressing one for everyone, and they wonder what has happened to this place. May and Max can only think about how one of their best childhood memories is ruined. Luckily, the group won't have to wait long for an answer, as a man named Marcel, the overseer of the sanctuary, comes out. May and Max begin to bombard him with questions about the sanctuary, not really giving Marcel a chance to talk. This is where Brock steps in, saying to give the man a chance to explain, causing them to both stop for a moment. The man tells them that a wild Snorlax entered the sanctuary about a week ago and has been eating all the food that the Slackoth normally eat. Normally, it would be enough to sustain their population year-round, but if the Snorlax isn't stopped, then the Slackoth won't have enough food to make it through the end of the month. Realizing the situation is dire, our heroes offer their assistance, with Ash telling the man that he has the experience dealing with those Snorlax, as he has one of his own back in Pallet Town, so he will happily take care of this issue. The man is instantly relieved at this offer, telling them that he will gladly take any help he can get. Smiling, Ash tells him to point the way, to which the man leads them deep into the banana grove of trees. As they walk, the Slackoth finally come into view. Ash's Slackoth can see them, and once 
wants to make friends, but they all just hide. Marcelo explains that Slackoth are normally friendly creatures, but since the Snorlax showed up, they've all been scared to engage with anyone. This causes something to stir within Ash's Slackoth, as for the first time, it stands on its hind legs and begins to move with a pace that Ash didn't even know it could. Slackoth, are you okay, Ash asks? But the normal type simply continues to push forward as it wants to find Snorlax. But that won't take long, as the Behemoth comes into view. It's here that Slackoth begins to make demands of it, but Snorlax simply ignores it in favor of stuffing its face. This causes Slackoth to become irritated, which Ash can see. Slackoth then does something that it hasn't done in the entire time that Ash, May, or Max have seen since they have known it. The Sloth engages Snorlax in battle, trying to land a slash, but it's quickly battered away as Snorlax ignores it in favor of eating. Snorlax is angered even further as it attempts to slash once more, but Snorlax, now agitated, uses a move that Slackoth knows all too well in Yawn that catches it off guard. Before Slackoth or Ash knows it, the normal type is off to Lala Land as Snorlax continues to eat the food source of the other Slackoth. As the man bear pig moves away in search of food, Ash awakens his normal type, asking if it's okay, but Slackoth isn't. The look on its face says it's all. It is frustrated at not being able to help its fellow Slackoth. It then lets out a cry of anger as it begins to glow in an evolutionary light. Before Ash knows what's happening, his normal type has taken on its high-strung second stage, Vigoroth. The Pokemon is a complete 180 from Slackoth as Ash uses his Pokedex to find out about it. Vigoroth has more energy than he knows what to do with, as it signals it wants another crack at Snorlax. But Ash doesn't know how evolving will help it. Snorlax still has Yawn, and if Vigoroth gets hit by it again, then the battle will be over. But this is where May uses her years of experience with his evolutionary line to offer some insight here. Ash, Vigoroth is actually the perfect Pokemon to do this. It has the ability Vital Spirit, which means it can't be put to sleep. Using his Pokedex, Ash she is that May is right. So the boy looks at Vigoroth and asks if it really wants to do this. The ball of agitation responds by running off in the direction that Snorlax went. Ash takes off after it with the others in tow. Moments later, they arrive in an all-out battle between the two as Snorlax is unable to deal with Vigoroth. Wanting to provide support, Ash steps in, giving commands where needed. It's here that Vigoroth reveals its slash attack has evolved just as it had into the much more powerful Crush Claw. This is enough to give Vigoroth the edge to take down Snorlax. Quick to act, Marcel throws a heavy ball that he had saved for this occasion that is able to capture the normal type, bringing this whole altercation to an end. Vigoroth does a little dance to celebrate its first victory since its evolution. The normal type is super aggressive in giving Ash a hug. The boy is a bit overwhelmed at first, but quickly realizes that this is just Vigoroth's way of showing its happiness at them being friends. Though Ash will have to teach it to control its new power, Vigoroth is a welcome addition to his team as it and the rest of Ash's friends are able to spend the rest of the day playing with Slackoth in the sanctuary. However, the evolution of Vigoroth doesn't sit well with one of our heroes as Max watches it play with Ash, thinking that it's unfair, but says nothing to anyone around him. Now with Ash's newest team member evolution out of the way, our heroes finally make their way to the site of the next contest, Lilico City. The whole place is packed as our heroes make their way to the Pokemon Center. Luckily, they were able to make it rather quickly, as Nurse Joy was about to give out the last couple of rooms. This is much to the relief of May, as she had been wanting to get a nice hot shower and some relaxation before she had to start practicing for the contest that is in three days time. But there are some things here that all of our heroes are going to need to do individually before they can call it a day. So they all decide to meet back here when the sun goes down. This is going to allow us to follow Ash as with the contest in three days time he needs to make a call to Professor Oak. The reason is a simple one. He has accepted that Mawile is his best contest performer and since he wants to enter a class other than tough he will need the steel type if he has any hopes of winning. So picking up the phone Ash dials the number and gets the professor right away. The conversation is brief as Ash knows who he is trading out, his water type, Feebas, for the time being. This is a blessing in disguise as the professor has wanted to study one of these for a while now as they are compared to Magikarp for how weak they are. However, the last thing that Ash tells the old man is not to underestimate his Feebas as its strength may surprise him. With that, Ash hangs up the phone but is immediately stopped with a familiar voice calling his name. Turning, Ash sees his old rival Tyson. The boy is happy to see Ash, but Ash is even more excited to see Tyson, asking how many badges he has. The rival reveals that he has six of the eight badges that the League requires to enter, while Ash is impressed as he reveals he only has four. This isn't the only thing that catches Ash's attention though, as at the side of his rival is a Pokemon that Ash is very familiar with due to his past adventures, though he has to admit that it is oddly dressed. It's a Meowth in boots and a cowboy hat. Tyson explains that he caught this Pokemon a while back when he was near Evergrande City, as 
as he was headed to Mosteep. It was severely wounded and couldn't walk, so he gave it these boots to help protect its feet. Ever since then, it's been one of his most reliable Pokemon. This story has an idea pop into Ash's head, as he asked Tyson if he would like to have a battle. He still owes him for that loss back in Rustboro. Smiling, Tyson says that he has a few minutes to spare, so how about they head outside? Moments later, the two find themselves behind the Pokemon Center. Tyson suggests a two-on-two, -two, but Ash wants something a little bit more intense, as he suggests that they have the same type of battle they did before. So another tag battle? Okay, Ash, you're on. The two boys ready their Pokeballs, as they both reveal their choices at the exact same time. For Ash, he wants to go with power. So what better than his newly evolved Vigoroth and his Ace of the Hoenn region, Grovile. For Tyson, he has the same mindset, but chooses his starter, the final evolution of Trico, Sceptile, and the fighting type. Hariyama. As the four emerge from their balls, Grovile is surprised by the Pokemon that stands next to it. Vigoroth is completely different, and the change in its power shows. This causes the grass type to become uneasy, but it shakes it off for the time being, as this is a rematch that it has been waiting for. Both Ash and Tyson give their commands, revealing just how much stronger each Pokemon has become. The power of Ash's Pokemon are impressive to Tyson, as they can match both of his Pokemon, which are fully evolved, but he won't be outdone, as Sceptile and Grovile both clash with the Leaf Blade and Fury Cutter. While the mid-stage has the type advantage in this exchange, it is unable to match the raw power of its evolution as it takes the Leaf Blade, sending it into a nearby tree. As Grovile stands up to shake off the shock of losing that exchange, it sees something happening that is going to break it inside, as Vigoroth goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with not only one, but both of their opponents. The grass starter does nothing but stand there in a trance as its pride in its own power is slowly cracking in the realization that Vigoroth is beginning to surpass it. All the while, it's completely oblivious oblivious to the calls from Ash to get back into the battle. Eventually, our hero just abandons Grovile so that way he can focus on Vigoroth. It's a good thing he did this, as the normal type is able to land a yawn on Hariyama that eventually puts it to sleep. This gives it the opening needed to take it out with the Crush Claw, just leaving Sceptile. However, while Vigoroth is stronger, it has taken some heavy blows when battling a two-on-one, and even with the assistance of Slackoff, it still ends up falling to the speed and power of Sceptile. Ash walks out to help his Mon up, thanking it for all the effort that it put in, and tells it not to worry. It just evolved, so it'll take time to get used to that new power. Tyson compliments Ash on the strength of his Pokemon, saying that he thought that he was going to lose. If Grovile had been helping, then he may have. The two look at the grass type, who is just staring blankly back at Tyson, asking if it's okay. Ash says he doesn't know. It has been acting very strange as of late, even going as far as ignoring Ash's orders. But this is the first time that it has completely frozen in battle. Well, I hope you can figure it out. I'm sure it will be a huge part of your team when you do. I hope so, Ash says. Now, we shift perspective over to the one called Phantom, as he has arrived back at the base of Team Aqua. Archie is pleased with the results, as this will for sure allow them to free Kyogre. Phantom tells his leader that there is just one more thing that they need to find the Sea Temple, and he has it on good authority that it is closer than they think. Well then, let's begin to make the final preparations, and track down the remaining pieces of the orb in the meantime, Archie says, as he he looks at a map of the region with several blinking dots on it. And this is where we are going to end things for now. So tell me how you felt about this part. Did you like the rematch that Ash had with Winona? How do you like Ash's newest capture in Spoink? Are you excited that Vigoroth has finally evolved? What about the battle that they had at Mount Pyre and the introduction of Phoebe? And thanks for Rune Scribble for voicing that part, by the way. And also, what about the issues that Grovile is having? How will it affect things going forward? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And that's all we had for today's video. I really appreciate you guys stopping by to watch all the way to the end. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. If you guys really enjoy my content, consider following me on some of my other platforms like Discord, where you can get to know other people who are interested in what ifs, or on Twitter, where I post sometimes behind the scenes updates. Or if you want to help the channel grow a little bit extra, why don't you consider donating like the people right here have? As whatever you could offer could help us get to a larger audience by helping us get new videos done or some of the projects that we were custom art is getting kind of expensive. So we want to make sure that we have the funds to do that. But with all that being said, I really hope you guys enjoyed everything and I will see you in the next video.